Welcome. I'm Sebastian Mafud, and you're listening to WCAT Radio, the on-air wing of En Route Books and Media, bringing you the dulcet sounds of Catholic wisdom. Welcome, on Lisa. We are in show number 54. And we were just talking about that. This brings to the end volume one. This is the transition into volume two, which is the life, really, of... Peter Richard Kenrick, I'm going to call the second volume The Lion and the Fourth City, because St. Louis was at the time known as the fourth Fourth city, city. fourth largest. And as we'll see, there's a reason why Peter Richard Kenrick was known as the 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 lion. lion. (laughs) You know, see that right off the bat, actually. He was preceded by a a pretty impressive figure himself. Yeah, I I have the highest admiration for uh, Bishop Joseph Rosati. We can only be thankful and know that we earned our Rome of the West from the lives that led us to it. What a beautiful city we have, thanks to the lives given from all of these wonderful men. That's for sure. And then also along with that, you know, the story is not just uh, these prelates, but the fact that prelates, but the fact that they touched and, and tapped so many other dedicated religious and priests and, and laity to make the city what it is. Uh, it, it's quite a story. Right. And their wisdom when they went on those bigging tours to bring the orders of nuns that came here and all the priests that, you know, were inspired to come and join them and come to St. Louis. We are uh, eternally grateful for their contribution to the city. Definitely. And I'm sure that Peter Richard Kenrick would not have believed a word we just said (laughs) when he arrived in St. Louis. He arrived by himself. He came on December 28th of 1841. Uh, Remember that he had just been plucked out of his brother's arms in Philadelphia, made a bishop, and then put on a stagecoach and and made his way to the West. He was actually traveling with a friend, a companion, uh, Michael O'Connor, and they had traveled from Philadelphia to Pittsburgh by stagecoach. And then at that point, they got on the Ohio River and went by boat all the way down to Cape Girardeau. And at Cape Girardeau, Michael O'Connor took off in a different direction. And this newly minted bishop went to Cape Girardeau, I assume St. Vincent's, and celebrated Christmas with them there. And then in the next three days, made his way up to St. Louis. When he got to St. Louis, it was a very quiet arrival. <laughs> it was not like the DeBorg arrival that, uh, right. you remember? Crossing the river. Crossing the river and everybody there <laughs> the and all fanfare. that. fanfare. Yeah. When uh, Bishop Kenrick came to St. Louis, he was greeted by one priest. Wow. That was it. And yet his episcopacy would be the longest in the history of St. Louis. He had just turned 35 years old that August. He had served as the pastor of the cathedral in Philadelphia. At the same time, he was the president rector of the seminary. He was also the vicar general for the diocese. And he was also the editor of the diocesan newspaper, the Catholic Herald. And on top of all of this, he succeeded in publishing three books. Wow. This guy is a, a classic overachiever. I was going to say, so he's no slouch. <laughs> no. Uh-uh. Say a little bit about the books, especially one book, because it tells us something about this personality of a lion. One of the books that he decided to write, nowadays they call it the third rail. Okay. You, know, you don't want to touch this one because you get electrocuted, you know. But he jumped right in. In 1841, he wrote a book entitled The Validity of Anglican Ordinations. Oh, wow. Yeah, in which he argued from an historical perspective that the ordinations were not valid. Okay. Now, at this point, Rome had not spoken definitively on this. It's not going to be until Leo the Thirteenth that you're going to have a definitive statement from Rome. And at that point, they're going to say basically Peter Richard Kenrick was correct in his assessment. But as you can well imagine, not everybody, especially the Anglicans, didn't <laughs> we're, take we're to pleased. this. <laughs> and in fact, in 1844, there was another book that was published as a counter to his book. And this was by a layman, an Anglican Episcopalian named Hugh David Evans. And the title of his book was Essays to Prove the Validity of Anglican Ordinations, an answer to the Right Reverend Peter Richard Kenrick, Roman Catholic Bishop of St. Louis, by a layman. Wow. That's quite a title. 
So Kenrick, despite having all kinds of other stuff going on, sat himself down and wrote another book. And it was entitled The Validity of Anglican Ordinations Examined. (laughs) And it even went through a second edition in 1848. So, you know, he's feisty. Mm -hmm. He's not going to back off. And right away, people began to realize that his Episcopal motto really did mean something. Mm -hmm. And you might remember it's Noli Irritare Leonum. Nobody to irritate the lion. He's he's going to find himself with some issues at the very beginning, besides his little publishing issues. <laughs> and one of the things he is acutely aware of is that by now, the French language was rapidly disappearing from St. Louis. Certainly prior to that, even up into the 1830s, you could hear French spoken. But the older French language priests were concerned about this. They were smarting at it because their congregations were getting older and older and older. And at the same time, the demographics of St. Louis was such that you had an awful lot of English speakers coming in. These are, for the most part, Americans, of course, but also Irish immigrants. Oh, mm-hmm. The Americans coming in, with some exceptions, were not Catholic. And so the Protestant side of St. Louis is is starting to grow. The Irish coming in are very poor, but they're going to be English speakers, and they're not going to want to learn French, obviously. Right. And then added to that, there's a new language coming in, taking over, German. And so after 1830, particularly, a lot of Germans coming in. Kenrick is going to have to deal with these things. He's going to deal with them rather forcefully. And one of the things he's going to realize that unlike the Catholic population of Philadelphia, the Catholic population of St. Louis is quite docile to its bishop. The old French aristocracy, when Kenrick basically told them, look, your day is done, and we're not having sermons in French anymore, nobody except you guys understand it, they basically said, oh, Okay. Okay. (laughs) That was it, you know. But Kenrick had another problem on his hands, and that was the huge debt from the cathedral, which Rosati had built but had not entirely paid for. In fact, when he first got there, he found the debt was up as high as $58,000. Wow. Which is a lot of money back then. Right. What we find is that immediately he seeks solace from his older brother the Bishop of Philadelphia. And so there's a lively correspondence that goes back and forth between Francis Patrick and Peter Richard. And it's really fascinating stuff. We have those letters in our archives here in St. Louis as well as in Philadelphia. But you have to be able to read Latin because the two of them, they kept their language skills up by writing to each other entirely in Latin. Good. Yeah, yeah, it it was pretty neat. The older Kenrick would write back to the younger Kenrick, assuring him that Bishop Rosati would be returning shortly (laughs) and using this flowing terms that the crown of thorns, which is the burden of all governing bishops, would be taken off of Peter (laughs) Richard. And, And at one point, Francis Patrick writes to Peter Richard and says, look, cool it with your letters to Bishop Rosati. Evidently, he was constantly complaining about things in St. Louis and how bad things were. And so Francis Patrick says this and in one of his letters. He says, I fear your straightforward way of bringing to his, Rosati's, notice the conditions of things has made him sad. Oh. And say something nice from time right. to time. <laughs> Very early on, the coadjutor, Kenrick, made some personnel decisions. One of the things he decided was that Father Lutz now had come back to St. Louis. He made him his secretary, which was a good thing. And then for Father Saulnier, who is this rather aristocratic Frenchman with good taste and uh, loves the city life. You know, he was in the smallest St. Louis, who was at least it was city life and had one unfortunate experience in Arkansas. Right. Now he gets sent back, this time to New Madrid oh. to be the pastor there. In 1843, the bishop found himself writing three demissorial letters. So three priests from his diocese have been transferred out. They're excardinated out of his diocese into other dioceses. So he loses three priests. But that same year, he ordained nine. Oh, good. Yeah. Other good news comes in. Uh, in April, he received a, a nice little gift from the Austrian Leopoldine Society. 
uh, some $2,300 was given to the Diocese of St. Louis. And that becomes really important because in the last several years, after 1830, money began drying up. Mm -hmm. Neither the Leopoldine Society nor the Propagation of the Faith was sending much money in this direction. They had been really important supporters. Kendrick wanted to know why. And at first, it was concluded that it was because of the Revolution of 1830 and all the disruptions that took place there. But then he inquires a little bit more, and he finds out there's a rumor circulating throughout Europe that St. Louis doesn't need the money anymore. It's got a great, big, beautiful cathedral. So he has to write back and explain to these societies that, yeah, we've got a beautiful cathedral, but we haven't paid for it yet. Right. And we've got all this debt going on. There's also a rumor that's circulating around that he has to dispel, too, and that is that English-speaking bishops in America are giving the German immigrants the back of the hand, mm -hmm. and that when the Austrian German language societies like the Leopoldine Society is sending money over, the rumor has it that the English-speaking bishops are using it for other purposes than for the, uh, the German populations. He has to, again, dispel that and show that that wasn't true. Not only does this have important implications for the Leopoldine Society, but the Society for the Propagation of the Faith, which had been heavily supported by French money, especially Lyon. Now, after 1830, that did start shriveling up. Okay. And so what they had to do then was they had to rely more and more. This is the Society for the Propagation of the Faith was getting money from Bavaria. Oh. So the Bavarians were actually contributing to this French society. Now, when you think about the Leopoldine Society, you know, by this time, they had already sent over to the United States $280,000 wow. for the various dioceses. St. Louis alone got almost $18,000 wow. from them. And so in November of 1843, Kenrick then penned a letter to the president of the Leopoldine Society. This is Archbishop Milda. The letter expresses great gratitude for the donations that have been received to date, that's important, and then explained how they serve the German Catholic community in his diocese. He pointed out that the cathedral had two German-language priests assigned to the cathedral, that sermons were preached every Sunday in German at all of the 8 a.m. Masses. And that implies, of course, also that confessions could be heard in, mm -hmm. heard in German. He also pointed out that, that the Holy Days of Obligation, there would be a Mass specifically for Germans there. He pointed out also that at St. Louis University, one of the chapels, this is the chapel of St. Aloysius, was dedicated entirely for the German speakers to be able to go there. In South St. Louis, where more and more Germans were beginning to move, the Mass was preached in German every Sunday at Blessed Trinity Parish, which is no longer with us now, mm -hmm. but at the time, and it was uh, conducted by a Vincentian at the diocesan seminary. They had moved part of the seminary up to South St. Louis, the Crandellet, for a while, and one of the Vincentian priests who was fluent in German would take care of the people there. Bishop Kenrick also mentioned that it was Bishop Rosati's wish that a parish would be erected in St. Louis specifically for Germans, assuring him of all of that. Interestingly enough, in this letter, he doesn't mention anything about what the church was doing for Germans in the rural areas. You know, St. Charles County and Apple and Creek and Westphalia. Westphalia, all that. And I think the reason is that he's so new to St. Louis that he's still learning the city. Sure. And he doesn't mm -hmm. realize what's going on in the other parts of his diocese still. He also dispelled the fact that the diocese was wealthy. He pointed <laughs> out that he's holding a debt of over $60,000 and some of it at quite high rates of interest. He continued writing these letters to Bishop Milda. In one of the letters points out that St. Louis had a population of somewhere between 35,000 and 40,000 people, of which 40 to 50 percent were Catholic. And he believed that there were at least 7,000 German Catholics in the city of St. Louis itself. So it's quite a sizable number. And then he boasts the following. He says... As no city in the United States enjoys greater opportunities for the practice of the Catholic religion, 
so there is none that expresses Catholic life and Catholic character better than St. Louis. Wow. So for a guy that was complaining a lot, he certainly is becoming a booster. <laughs> <laughs> the letters that are sent and the reports that were sent to Austria very diplomatically were all done in the German language. Uh, he um, is wise. <laughs> oh, yes. Oh, yeah. We have these letters. They're, they're all archived. And uh, somebody painstakingly sat down and translated them into English for us, too. But they're available at our archives. Peter Richard Kenrick is not unfamiliar with the German language. There are a few times he'll use it. Remember that when he was a boy uh, working in his father's office, that there was a another a worker in that office who is a, a rather famous Irish poet. This is uh, James Clarence Mangan. He tutored Peter Richard in German. Probably it's Father Lutz who is the real translator on these uh -huh. letters. That would make a lot of sense. Well, Peter Richard Kenry served a year and a half as coadjutor when he received word that Bishop Rosati had died and that he would now become the ordinary for the Diocese of St. Louis. Immediately, he begins thinking in terms of expanding the parishes in St. Louis. Right now, when he arrives, there's only one parish or chapels uh, that are available, but there's only one real church there, and that's the, the cathedral itself. Wow. And so he begins moving toward expanding others, and eventually, uh, very rapidly, five other parishes are going to be established by him. One of those is at uh, St. Louis University, and he's going to encourage the Jesuits to erect a uh, a church there. And remember that, that this is on Washington Avenue. It's not the present campus. This is downtown. And that would be St. Francis Xavier Church. Okay. okay. Later on, the Jesuits are going to want to uh, build a much larger church than what they originally put up. And he's going to be very much against that because he thinks that they're going to be robbing more parishioners away from other English-speaking. But this was going to be an English-speaking parish. Mainly Irish and American Catholics would be attending. Further north on Ninth and Biddle. Another parish was established. This is St. Joseph's, and that'll serve the German population on the north side. Ultimately, one of the finest churches in America is going to be built there, the Shrine of St. Joseph. Absolutely. Yeah. Love that church. <laughs> yeah. It's, it's, it's magnificent. It really is. But, of course, the first parish, it's, the church is not going it's to be not, It's not the one that's standing right. currently. Right? No, but it's a beginning. But and it, the Jesuits would be given the uh, responsibility of that parish. Oh, did the Jesuits? I didn't realize that. Um, looking south of, uh, of the cathedral, but not very far south, actually, is on 3rd and Gratio. Our Lady of Victories will okay. be established, and that's going to be for the Germans who are living in the city itself. And, of course, that's going to be a great, great parish, uh, too. And, again, even today, it's well worth a, a visit to that, to that church. Absolutely. Yeah. It is. It's a beautiful church, yeah. and it is just the, really a stone's throw from the, the, the old cathedral. Old cathedral. You, you could walk there easily. Absolutely. You yeah. could. Yeah. I'm not, I don't know that I recommend it, but yes, you could. <laughs> <laughs> no, that's true. <laughs> that poor church is surrounded by by highways. And, it and is. It's it's, just, it's, yeah, it's, yeah, it can be a little confusing getting down there, but it's certainly worth it. Yeah. <laughs> well, further south on 9th and Decatur, uh, St. Vincent is going to be established. St. And Vincent. that is going to be a dual language parish. Uh, there's a, a large German population in that area, but also there are English speakers. Okay. And uh, a very interesting, as time goes on, a very interesting relationship is going to be established in that it might be a model for us in, in multi-language parishes because they're going to actually have co-pastors. Oh, really? A German pastor and an English pastor. And then going further north is going to be the founding of St. Patrick's. The founder of that is going to be Father George Hamilton, who is quite a character, <laughs> as we'll see later on. Okay. Um, he, he can write up some pretty w wicked letters himself. <laughs> Going back, Our Lady of Victories, who was that it's parish? To... A German. It was a German parish, too. Yeah, it was going to okay. be Germans, yeah. Okay, okay. St. Patrick's was a gift. The, the The land was a gift by Mrs. Ann Biddle. Oh. And we're going to find some of the laity in St. Louis are absolutely incredible with their generosity. 
Ann Biddle's mother, Mrs. Malamphy, is going to actually give $1,000 toward the building of that St. Patrick's. Now, let's take a look at schools, because now schools are coming about very rapidly. Attached to St. Francis Xavier, there's going to be two schools. One is going to be called the Female Free School, okay, and it's run by the Sisters of Charity. This is that same order that's running St. Louis Hospital. It's going to have 175 girls there. And then there's going to be another school, the male free school, and that's going to have 350 boys. Wow. And it's going to be run by four Jesuit scholastics. Wow. Yeah. Four. Yeah, four. You can imagine. And then later there's going to be another, it's going to be called the Catholic free school, and that's going to be opened up in October of 1844, and that's for German boys. And it's going to be run by the Jesuits. And that further south, down in St. Mary's, are the Barons continuing serving the uh, seminary for the Vincentians. The diocesan st- students are for a while going to be brought up to South St. Louis. And the hope there was that the faculty would be able to serve the Catholic population in uh, Grand Lat, especially at the Church of the Holy Trinity. At the time that the Soulard edition was, and we'll talk more about the spreading of, of St. Louis also, but in that, that area that we know of as Soulard, it's called the Soulard edition, and the houses that were built there, some of those were actually constructed by Bishop Rosati. Wow. And his intention was, it was a whole row of houses, and his intention was to either rent or sell those houses to Catholic families in order to sort of seed that area. It would have been great, but unfortunately it was all destroyed in a fire. Mm. By the time the seminarians arrived, about 15 seminarians came, but they didn't have a seminary. And so they ended up living at the Soulard Mansion. The Soulard family gave them use of their, their mansion. St. Vincent's College was established down in Cape Girardeau. There some 12 students were enrolled. There are another 32 that are still in Perryville. So there's a, you know, in the pipeline, there's still a lot of seminarians uh, coming along. By May of 1843, some very interesting things happened to the Diocese of Peter Richard Kendrick, of which he was more than happy to have happen. Okay. And what happened was, as a result of the recommendations of the Fifth Baltimore Provincial Council, Chicago was made a diocese. And with that, all of Illinois became its Episcopal see. So those cities on, on that we claimed are now... Are now part of uh, Chicago, right? Little Rock was raised to a diocesan status, and so the southern part of the diocese was taken care of there. Milwaukee was made a diocese, as well as Dubuque. And way over in in the far west, the Oregon territories, which had been... Incredibly, the responsibility of St. Louis, they became a vicariate apostolic, and they were under the direction of Bishop Francis Blaché. And so we didn't have to worry about that. So in other words, St. Louis now, St. Louis Diocese, is going to be the state of Missouri plus all the territories that ran to the Rocky Mountains. So still no small area there, but no small that area, cuts off but, quite a bit around the outside yeah, there. Yeah, so. and so Peter Richard Kenrick is able now to center his attention on the city of St. Louis itself and on, on the state of Missouri, and then there's going to be some things that are going to be happening further out west. Well, shall we close Volume 1 then? Yes, and we'll open up a new volume next time around. All right. Okay. Glory be to the Father, to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit. As it was in the beginning, is now, and ever shall be, world without end. Amen. May Almighty God bless you in the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Thank you so much, Monsignor. Okay, certainly. We hope you enjoyed the program and will join us back for another show on WCAT Radio. This is Sebastian Mafud. Good day.